today we're going to hear from Christian Kieselowski, who's going to talk about if we could only account for every single atom, which is probably no surprise to you since that is up on the board. Let me uh, introduce Dr. Kieselowski. He received his PhD from the University of Cologne in 1985 um, for spectroscopic studies of dislocations in semiconductors. In 1990, he received his habilitation in German universities. That's a degree that qualifies one for professorship and also from Cologne. And then the year later, because this was the year that uh, Germany was uh, unified and uh, there was very little money for, uh, scholar, uh, for uh, research at that time, uh, in 1991, he joined the microphysics department at AT&T Bell Labs in the US. Uh, there, he developed image processing methods for studying subsurface solid state processes at near atomic level. In 1994, he joined UC Berkeley, where he studied the growth and characterization of the important semiconductor, gallium nitride, arsenide, pardon me, gallium arsenide. Oh, it was gallium nitride, okay. We got the, got, got the right semiconductor here. In 1997, he became a staff scientist at NSIM, which, which is the National Center for Electron Mi Microscopy here at uh, LBL. And he is now a pr principal investigator there. At NSIM, Dr. Kieselowski first demonstrated sub-angstrom resolution in phase contrast microscopy. That's the first of a number of terms which uh, I will ask Dr. Kieselowski to define for us later. I'm not going to do it myself because I don't know what they mean. He used this technique to visualize columns of the lightweight atoms, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in closely spaced lattices. His current projects include correcting aberrations and other ways of improving the sensitivity of electron microscopes so they can be used to study single atoms, and that's what we're going to hear about today. These improvements and a better understanding of electron scattering are essential for the development of electron tomography, one of the goals of the TEAM project. TEAM stands for Transmission Electron Aberration Free Microscopy, the next stage in the development of the electron microscope in which NSEM is playing a major role. So here is Christian Kieselowski to define all these mysterious terms for us and to tell us something about the extraordinary advances in our ability to peer into the world at the atomic scale. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction um, and welcome to this uh, lunch sessions. You will see a lot of movies, so uh, I hope you will enjoy that uh, particular session today. Um, we are all very excited in electron microscopy these days and what I would like to do in this talk is give you a little bit of an impression what's ongoing and where this excitement comes from and of course it is related to the fact that we kind of now head for single atoms so that we really can account for every atom that we observe. And that's actually quite a challenge and we are not there and I will show in this talk you know, what the bottlenecks are and uh, uh, where, how, how we want to solve them. So, let me see. Okay, whoever was up at the NCM, these are the instruments that we have, have up there, you know. So if you think about microscopy in terms of optical terms, they are much bigger, you know. They are kind of buildings that, that uh, uh, for example, the atomic oops. For example, the atomic resolution microscope, it's a three-story building. And if you kind of look for the newer microscopes that we have at the moment, you know, they are kind of smaller, they fit a room. Um, so people have learned a lot to go from this towards this type of microscopes. And so what I will touch in my talk is basically, you know, the past, talking a little bit what this guy, about what this guy can do. And then the present, which is these two instruments, this is something which we kind of uh, have heard a lot about. You know, it's one of the record breakers that we have at the NCM. It's ex it, in fact, it produces world records. And that's the latest acquisition that we have. And uh, so I will talk about these things in terms of the present abilities that we have at the NCM. And then I would look a little bit into the future, what we want to do with the electron microscopes these days. Okay, there is a uh, word from Richard Feynman from the 60s. And what he actually said at that point of time is the following. It would be very easy to make an analysis of any complicated chemical substance. All one would have to do would to look at it and see where the atoms are. The only trouble is that the electron microscope is 100 times too poor. I put this out as a challenge. Is there no way we, make, we can make the electron microscope more powerful? And he said that in 1960. And so this is a view graph that, 
that I kind of uh, uh, got from Harald Rose. He was the first to produce something like that. It shows electron uh, uh, microscope resolution uh, for optical microscopy here. And down there is the years where particular breakthroughs occurred. And then comes the electron microscope. And now we are in the year 2000 and uh, we are going up there. Now, uh, what I would like to do first is actually, you know, if you talk about resolution to people who are not so much familiar with electron microscopy, it's one thing. Uh, if you just visualize the whole thing, it's a totally different thing. So what I want to do right now is actually give you a right through magnification. You either, either uh, think about this scale or through years. You see this is a development over 200 years. And for that we have two prepared movies. Um, one is about solids, it's about a spark plug, and the other one is about biology, which is about a leaf, a mint leaf, and maybe we can start these movies at that point. To the naked eye, this is just an ordinary spark plug. One flash, and the motor starts. But the white, isolating sheath is far from ordinary. It's made of alumina a sophisticated ceramic capable of resisting extremely high temperatures. Tiles made of this ceramic form the protective casing on the space shuttle. We can now see a tiny chip which was invisible just a few moments ago. The fault appears to have devastated the smooth surface, creating a chaotic landscape of sharp ridges. Terraces materialize on the slopes of this mountainous structure. They're the steps of a staircase resulting from breaks in the atomic structure of the alumina. A multitude of these tiny breaks each one perpendicular to the other gives this angular aspect to the surface of the ceramic. As we look into one of these steps, others, even smaller, are revealed. Deeper inside, we discover a microstructure, more detailed still, made up of minute grains of alumina. The diagonal line crossing the screen joins two of these grains, welding them together and giving the structure strength. The fewer impurities there are in these joins, the stronger the ceramic. Even under such high magnification, this join appears clean and neat. Moving closer, the surface is bloated and cracked. Electrons emitted by the microscope have almost punctured the matter. By luck, the two grains of alumina are positioned differently. On the left, the atoms are seen flat, the vertical columns of atoms giving this striated effect. In contrast, the grain on the right shows up as a cross-section, each white point representing the peak of one of these columns. Alumina is known by another name, aluminium oxide. At this point, among a uniform mesh of oxygen and aluminium atoms, the microscope reaches its limits. comes another one. <laughs> Biology now. Smell. Here's some mint. A familiar plant whose unique aroma has made it a cherished ingredient for cooking all around the world. Looking closer, we can see the veins running through the leaf more clearly. They prolong the stem and constitute the irrigation system. Through these, 
the sap rises. The hairs which cover leaves and veins are special cells. They enable the leaf to limit evaporation. The more hairs there are, the more humidity is retained. Many bubbles rest on this skin made of a carpet of mint cells. Some are very small in the shape of a pip, others bigger and rather plump. The role of the smaller ones hasn't yet been established, but the bigger ones hold the essence of mint's characteristic perfume. The aroma is released when those capsules are torn. Small and resistant, all these bubbles are anchored in the leaf through a small stalk which is invisible on this screen. Before we get into the structure of the leaf, we move along a first layer of superficial cells. We can distinguish its outline, a slight puffiness, which could in some ways be called the skin of the leaf. When we look at a cross-section, the deep cells of the mint leaf are revealed. In here we find the chlorophyll, the pigment which gives the green colouring to plants. The chlorophyll is stored in these egg-shaped structures visible at the centre of the image, which are chloroplasts. More precisely, it's kept in these strange and regular piles. Photosynthesis takes place here. This is where the plant produces the sugars it needs and the oxygen we need. Our microscope has now reached its limits. Beyond this, nothing more is visible for the moment. So, uh, thank you very much. This is, uh, you know, a, a video is produced from a French company brought, brought to the NCM by actually Jean Ayash, who's, who's sitting there. And at the moment, we produce videos like that ourselves, you know, on gallium nitrides and, and then things like that. So we have fun at the NCM. Now, what I wanted to point out in this view graph, in addition, is if you look at these kind of things, you know, that something is very obvious. Um, each technology that mankind develops, you know, produces some type of scientific progress, progress, but it also saturates at some point of time. And uh, so optical microscopy, you know, in the 20s, there's not much progress in, in, in getting better resolution here. Now, the, th the thing developed drastically different once the electron microscopy was, was uh, introduced. And then you have a rapid increase. You can make a lot of scientific investigations, new scientific investigations again, you know, and then this technology saturates again. And at the moment, we have kind of heading up a new branch in this view graph. So that tells you actually that there is a new technology being implemented these days. And that's where the excitement comes from. Now the technology we talk about here is actually aberration correction. So it is uh, something like we give the electron microscopes glasses. And they can see better, and therefore we can do new science with that. And that's where the excitement comes from. Okay, so let me go now through a little bit uh, historically through time. You know, if you think about this big instrument that was the first instrument acquired at the NCM, uh, you can a lot of do a lot of excellent science with this with this type of microscopes. You could do it in the past, and you can do it right now. And the thing is, of course, the, uh, that that one would like to give an example about that. This is such an example here. Um, look at it this way, you know, when the, uh, everybody knows these days, you know, these small gizmos that people have, you know, at the chains and, and they kind of have these small LEDs there, you know, these, these very bright LEDs that, that, that you can use in the dark and things like that. I mean, this is a technology which was a, developed something like five years ago, six years ago. And actually, the Japanese were uh, leaders in that, in that technology. And so, every company nowadays 
has a small department somewhere in their, in their back room um, that they kind of uh, utilize to make what they call reverse engineering. So they look at the product of the competitor and then kind of find out, you know, what actually is happening exactly in such a small ship, why it is so bright. And so some years ago I actually was involved in that type of research and I bought 20 of these diets, you know, from the Japanese and then put it into our microscopes and see what is actually coming out, what they do and what they publish and see where the differences are. So this is uh, such a small chip. This is the diet that is in here. It's a very tiny chip which is in there. This is just a dime for comparison. And then we kind of take out the plastic, you know, we kind of cross-section this, this material, we look at the atomic resolution, we look at the active layer. And so the light actually comes from this very small dark line in here. That's where it is generated. It's something like 20 angstroms in width. And it makes this high uh, bright light. It's actually amazing if you start thinking about it. It's totally artificially built materials. Now, at that point of time, people didn't know exactly how much indium is actually in there, which is uh, an element that you put into the gallium nitride to change the color of this particular emission. Now, they wanted to have green and blue, and the, the, the expectation was actually that uh, you have to have something like 45% of indium in uh, these particular small quantum wells. Now, people tried that, of course. The whole world was trying to put in 45% of indium in there. Nobody succeeded. Now, and look what actually has happened in this particular material. So what we do with the microscope is, for example, we measure lattice parameters. So this is a, a lattice image from, from, from uh, gallium nitride. This is this dark line here. And then uh, if you put in indium, indium is a big atom in comparison with gallium. So it strains the lattice. It makes it appear larger. Aluminum, for example, if you put that into the quantum well, it makes the lattice shrink. So what we can do is, for example, measure that expansion or shrinkage of the lattice and quantify that. Now we can do that with an enormous precision. Uh, for example, you know, see, this is a strain which we put off here which is about 4%. The lattice constant of gallium nitride is something like 5 angstrom. 1% of strain means that you measure something like 1 hundredth of 5 angstrom as a displacement. So we talk about picometers here. We talk about five picometers of strain here that we can pick up locally with a resolution of five angstrom. Now, if you do that with a blue and a green LED, for example, you see the indium here, and then you see the aluminum here, and this goes up again to the words of gallium nitride. And now, this is what people expected. That's how much indium should have been in there. And you see, there is nothing like this indium concentration in this material. What you actually see is the difference between the blue and the green LED is just that the quantum well is a little bit thinner. So we use actually quantum effects, you know, confinement of energy states to change the color of the material. And so the whole world was running basically trying to put in this 45% indium while the Japanese were actually just changing a little bit the time schedule in their growth process to make green and blue LEDs. And, uh, this is some uh, example, you know, where you can really make an impact with electron microscopy help the American industry. So uh, that's, that's one of the examples that you can use. That's the atomic resolution electron microscope. So let me continue then a little bit and move from the old guy towards the two newer electron microscopes that I, I've shown. Now what is actually happening and what is new these days is actually that we have the choice of techniques. If I talk about phase contrast microscopy, it's an experiment like this one, where we have a parallel electron beam, shoot it onto a sample, large scale illumination would make one image which we call a lattice image and it shows up here. It's one way of doing an experiment. Now technology has enabled us these days, you know, to focus the electron beam. And the smallest spot we can do with an electron beam is around one angstrom these days. Which means that with an electron beam focused like that, you can hit an atomic column, single atomic column. And then you go ahead and you just scan through the image. So it's called scanning transmission electron microscopy. And then you produce the image by detecting this signal actually through a large angle annular dark field detector. So the detection schemes are different in these two things. But that's the principal difference between the STEM and the TEM, high resolution TEM, phase contrast microscopy, Z contrast microscopy. <coughs> 
Now let's talk first about phase contrast microscopy and understand what has been done over the last years, to where this progress comes from that we have at the moment. So this is just the principle of phase contrast microscopy. We have an electron beam, we have a sample. The electron beam uh, hits the sample, gets scattered there. We have one important lens in the electron microscope, which is the objective lens. That makes the biggest magnification. And then we just collect these beams and make an interferogram of beams. And that is something we call a lattice image. It is not the crystal structure itself in high resolution electron microscopy. The lattice images that people show you is an interferogram of beams. Now, what has been, uh, what were the novelties uh, is actually that the sources were changed so that we have field emission sources that gives you brightness and that enables, gives you a longer coherence of uh, length of the, of the uh, electrons if you look at it as, as waves. And that enables, for example, holography, electron holography. And also that enabled then a better stem. Now we have increased uh, stabilities, current voltage stabilities, technology has improved. And one very important point is that we have supporting technology, which is uh, uh, growing better and better. Computers, for example. I mean, these days we can handle gigabytes of data, for example. In four, ten years ago that was impossible to think about that. So we can make image processing much more efficient. Now, what you can see in this interferogram and the resolution that you can achieve is actually uh, determined by this objective lens. And this objective lens um, has what we call a CTF, a contrast transfer function. And that is plotted here for the big guy in the beginning and for the OAM, the middle guy in the beginning. This is the microscope I'm talking about. And uh, you can think about something like that as having here a scattering vector and here the transmission of the lens. Now, uh, it is something like an amplifier. Uh, at a certain, you know, not, not uh, let's say, uh, uh, wavelengths, you know, you get a certain transmission and other wavelengths you don't. So in an amplifier you would like to have this, for example, a square type of thing, like a head function or something like that. The uh, ARM is very close to it. So we have a transmission of frequencies from here to there. And this lower left limit gives you basically the resolution limit. So that's 1.4 angstrom, 1.5 angstrom in the ARM. Now the OEM has a much more complicated transfer function. And you see, dealing with something like that is actually, you know, a few years ago, impossible. Because it is such a complex thing that you kind of, you know, would not be able to dig out the proper information. It's only because we have computer technology that we can kind of do these now. Now what these things do to an image is depicted in the next view graph. This is uh, my daughter diving with the sharks in the Bahamas, you know, and what we do is we do put in a contrast transfer function, you know, on, on, onto that image and see how it would look, work, work and, and look like, you know. So if we just take this particular image, make a Fourier transform and put in no filter, no transfer function, you get back the image if you Fourier transform it backwards, you know. So that's what people do. They use usually the, Fourier, the, the description in reciprocal space because then it is a simple relation between the transfer function and uh, um, uh, the image, you know. You just multiply these things and, and you're fine. Now if you, for example, take in a low frequency filter, take out the middle here, you see all these dark values are disappeared in the image, you know. If you, for example, take a high frequency filter, you limit the resolution so the low frequency image is still there, but the resolution is gone. You know, that's the information, the, the resolution limit in the, in the, in the image, image. Now, if you take a head type of filter, like in the ARM, for example, you produce something like that, so it's an ARM image. Now, the OAM image does something horrible. You know, you have all these oscillations, you know, and you take out all this information in Fourier space in, in this type of circular uh, type of thing. And it kind of produces a very, very bad image. So if you see an image from the OAM, for example, it is a very bad one, and you cannot interpret that straightforward. But the trick that we do is basically we change the defocus observer of the objective lens and fill these gaps. So we recover all the information and we use a particular process for that which we call an exit wave reconstruction. And just to show what the effect on this kind of stuff is, is here. This is actually an investigation that I did together with uh, Robert Rich's group. Um, and here you have a lattice image. So that's a ceramic, that's silicon nitride. Now uh, this is an interferogram of beeps. That's something you would get with the OAM and the ARM if you just look at a single lattice image. 
Now, if, you, if I would anyone ask in this room, you know, tell me, please, where the atomic positions are in such an image, you would be lost. You have no idea where they are, you know, you have no idea what this image shows. And we need having theory to actually kind of compare the experiment with simulation, find out what's ongoing. Now, if we do the same story with the OEM and make this exit wave reconstruction, fill all the gaps, we actually recover the structure of silicon nitride. Do you see how much difference these images are? This is a lattice image. This is a direct structural image of silicon nitride in this particular projection. And you see, this is a simulation, and this is an experiment, and we can very well handle that particular process. And it is entirely enabled by computer technology. And we call that an exit wave reconstruction process. This is then published in ultra microscopy. Uh, Mike and I kind of uh, did two papers in there uh, showing to people that we kind of have an extremely good resolution, you know, at the, at the Berkeley Laboratory. In fact, in phase contrast microscopy, it's uh, the world best resolution that is there. Now let's go for the other particular experiment, you know, where you don't use a parallel illumination of the beam, but you use a focused electron beam and scan it across uh, the image. Now let's say this is an, the electron beam and it is scanned across the sample. So first of all you produce this image, which we call a Z-contrast image or high angular dark field image, and you can use that image to see where you are actually looking at. So you can, for example, pinpoint a particular position and make an experiment over hours by using drift control mechanisms, you know, to stay always at the same point. Now at the same time, you can, for example, then acquire uh, energy loss spectra. Now energy loss spectra, one of them is I've plotted here. This is basically the energy loss. This is the counts that you get in the detector. Uh, have very, very interesting characteristics because you see they reflect certain structures at certain positions of the energy loss. And that tells you about the chemistry. So if you record something like that at this energy loss, you learn about the nitrogen, you learn about the oxygen, its concentration, its binding to the neighbors, and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, if we, for example, use this microscope and hold the electron beam at a particular point, we can record in this direction basically the, electro the energy loss spectra. So we go to the next pixel and we record the energy loss, but next pixel, next. So you get a cube of information, tons and tons of information in there. And you can interpret them in terms of imaging, and you can interpret them in terms of spectroscopy. So you can maps, make maps, this is aluminum, uh, 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 gallium nitride on sapphire, so this is aluminum and oxygen, this is gallium and nitrogen, and you produce gallium maps, nitrogen maps, for each of the pixels that you have addressed. That's unbelievable what you can do these days. And if you just start thinking about, you know, what you would like to have with, uh, in terms of resolution in the energy spectrum, uh, we are actually world leaders in that area. We have now 200 milli electron volts of energy resolution out of a primary electron energy of 200 kilo electron volts. It's an, it's an unbelievable technology that enables that. Very exciting. Um, so this is just then some two examples, you know, and, and I thought I'd give you some examples about what you can do with these things. And this is an ongoing investigation. Nigel Browning is our expert in spectroscopy, and I collaborate with him on, on the STEM investigations. Um, so first of all, you again, again get a direct structure image. So this is gallium nitride here, and what you see in here is actually an edge dislocation in gallium nitride. So what you can do is you can place the electron beam, let's say, directly in the core of the dislocation, and you can place the electron beam somewhere else, and you look at the differences in the electronic structure, an investigation that is enabled now. In high-resolution electron microscopy, for example, this is one example, this is again sapphire and gallium nitride. So you see a direct a structural image, because we did this exit wave reconstruction. And, uh, um, we see all the light elements, for example, in the, in, the, in, the, in the sapphire. People could not resolve at any zone access sapphire before. So if we just blow up this small area here and see what we see, you see actually the bright spots are the aluminum atoms, the, the, the darker spots here are the oxygen atoms, and this is the highest resolution image that has been published so far. It's, 45, it's 85 picometers. And so uh, we kind of can see light elements, we have an incredible in resolution and all this kind of thing, and uh, we can utilize that for our users who come to the NCM you know, and do investigations there. Okay, that was the wrong button. Okay, 
But there is another area which is evolving more and more, and that's actually in situ microscopy. So uh, uh, John Spence once said, you know, uh, see if you kind of can really make a movie about what, how you make materials in a microscope, then uh, you actually know how to make these materials because you just saw that. So let's just make a movie about you know, how we can make materials you know, in the microscope. And uh, the left one is actually uh, the coalescence of two particles here. And it's a movie made by Chris Nelson at the NCM last year. And what you see is actually two gold particles here. And you see also some faint blobs here which are single gold atoms running across the screen. So let's just see how these particles merge. I hope it's, yeah. So we excite them basically through the electron beam and then we kind of watch what is happening and this is a video rate recording so it's 30 frames per second and the contrast is not very high but you can clearly see you know how this particle approaches the big one and gets eaten up by the big one and then it kind of you know forms a new particle here a new crystal so you see material growing in the electron microscope of course you know if you kind of do video rate recording you are not happy with that because the contrast is not as well as it should be you know so i kind of uh, put also a video on, on on ccd for example but the disadvantage is of course that we have one frame per second so let's just see uh, how atoms hop around if we if we if we just to move it on see what you should watch is here these edges and you will see how these this atoms, these gold atoms, just drop around these edges here, you know, and go back and forth. So columns of atoms and single gold atoms, but the contrast is much better. So actually, one of the, th the goals that we have is, you know, we, we need better recording media. You know, we need a CCD at high speed, for example. That's one of the things that, that we are very interested in. So let's move on. And let's talk about some of the applications that you can, what you can do with this kind of, kind of technology. And one of the things that are very interesting these days is that there's progress in many areas. It's in electron microscopy, for example, but it's also in theory. If you just think about the latest work that's been published from the laboratory, for example, uh, people claim that they can design new materials. They look at the periodic table of elements and say, look, I take element number 75, two, 29 and whatever, you know, make a new element out of that and I tell you what its physical properties are. Now, obviously, nobody can check on them. That's a good thing about <laughs> this whole known thing. But we are now in the positions of doing that. Now, see, in, in, uh, this is theory. This is actually a, a partial dislocation in gallium arsenide. So that's a gallium terminated 30 degree partial dislocation, low temperature grown gallium arsenide. It's kind of a, a non stoichiometric the material. And uh, uh, this is a, a collaboration that we have with the University at Berkeley, it was with uh, Daryl Sean and Ike Weber. And uh, what we do is basically we kind of try to make a calculation on exactly the same scale than we, what we observe in the experiments. So usually there are, in, in an image like that that we take, there are two to three thousand atoms in the image volume because you kind of make a projection along the z-axis. Now, first principles calculation can account for two, 20 to 50 atoms. That's something, what, 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 what is a typical number? So we use actually ultra soft potentials and an extension of the volume by elasticity. But then we have a simulated volume, which is exactly the volume that we measure in the microscope. And we can make a direct comparison between, you know, we can simulate what we expect, and we can measure what we kind of uh, uh, have simulated, and then compare these two and find out where we are standing. So uh, the precision as to which you, know, you can make such a comparison is actually amazing. It's coming down to the picometer scale, one hundredth of an angstrom. And uh, the reason why we do that, or why we kind of uh, pursue such a uh, project, is the following. Look at this experiment, for example. You know? So we were really happy that we can match all these this small details, the faint contrast here, the high contrast here, it's Ashelby twist, and, and all this kind of stuff with theory. And uh, we kind of had in most of the image, you know, an agreement between experiment and theory. If we scale down theory to the lattice parameter of, of gallium arsenide uh, to within two, three picometers, except for this particular area here in the core of the dislocation. So we tried all more sorts of things, you know, trying to improve lens aberration, trying to improve this, and trying to improve that. We cannot get rid of this discrepancy, 20 picometers, you know. 
So at some point, you know, people, uh, 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 came up and say, look, there is some strange things ongoing with stoichiometry in this material. Maybe there is a segregation. And Xiao Yu kind of looked at this material and finds, in fact, fluctuations of arsenic and gallium at these at the, at this particular stacking faults. And that's something which we kind of currently pursue. So what we did is actually we measured this dumbbell distance here. This is the gallium and the arsenic columns. And if you do that and plot the number of measurements versus the distance that you measure, you get this red curve. Now, the sigma of this red curve is two picometers. That's the precision as to which you can measure the position of an atomic column. Now, if you put in, for example, arsenic or gallium, this is something what Daryl just pursues at the moment, you stretch that distance by something like 10, 20 picometers. And so, if you want to address something like segregation of point effects in solids, you have to have values measured in the range of 1 to 30 picometers, which is why we push so much for that. If you want to address segregation and point effects, we need to measure the position of atomic columns to a precision of about 1 to 2 picometers. And you see actually that this is, you know, this is on the stacking fault here actually. It's, it's, it's then wider the distribution. Okay. So what do we want in material science these days? You know, if, if people come up to our laboratory and they kind of want to, want to find out what type of experiments they kind of would like to do and all that kind of stuff, uh, we need to provide guidelines, you know, for, for, for what is reasonable, you know. And this is, this is just an estimate about that. Many people know if you plot, for example, band gap versus lattice parameter as a typical plot, you know, that people use for ceramics, semiconductors, and stuff like that. And I just converted it to interatomic distances here. So uh, what you see is actually uh, many different semiconductors and ceramic materials. And I would like to draw your special attention to the silicon case here, which is there. Then there is the gallium nitride, which is there. And then there is this, the uh, uh, carbon. Of course, you know, the carbon-carbon the spacing is something like 1.6 angstrom. But usually in a crystal, we look in a projection. So it, we do not look straight at the bond, you know, but in a particular projection, this, the bond is tilted. And in the 110 projection, the diamond, for example, you know, the spacing of 1.6 uh, angstroms then appears at something like 0.9 picometers. So that's something, that's why we need the high, high resolution in the electron microscopes. Now, uh, if you just follow this trend line here and see, you know, how much energy change is actually involved per picometer change. It's an interesting number. You, what you get is basically it's one picometer of bond length change corresponds to something like 50 milli electron volts of energy re resolution. Uh, energy uh, value. So if you, if you go for one picometer of, of precision in the microscope, we also do want to make spectroscopy with 50 milli electron volts of energy resolution, which is where we are going to. The other thing that I would like to point out is resolution has a limit, you know. Uh, basically, we kind, of, we kind of look at a particular column and we can describe that column as having a cross-section so the electrons cannot penetrate in the center, they need to get around that. And uh, there are calculations about that and you see um, this is done for different atomic numbers, Z, different elements, and you see actually for light elements, the 0.8 angstrom that we have already at the NCM is the theoretical limit. So we can actually not improve, well, we can improve resolution, but we will not gain predictable things if we do so. Um, we can expect to be a little bit better to go to 0.5 angstrom of resolution and address heavy elements there. And so, so uh, we want to have a resolution of about 0.5 angstrom and we're approaching theoretical limits here. We want to have a precision of about one picometer. And of course, we want to have a sensitivity for single atom detection. That's what we want in material science these days. And if you do spectroscopy, we want to have that with an energy resolution of about 50 milli electron volts. That's what we are heading for. Now, this is a nanoparticles, and of course, a lot of people, you know, nanotechnology and electron microscopy, they go basically together. So we have a lot of uh, interaction it's there. And this is a picture taken some years ago by, by Ferdinand working in Chemla's group. And uh, it's a cadmium selenide based core shell structure. Now we did an exit wave reconstruction on that. Oops. Mm -hmm. An exit wave reconstruction on that. And if I just make a line profile across, this image here, you actually come up with this particular pattern here. Now if you look at that pattern a little bit more carefully, you actually almost see that you kind of see steps here. So that suggests actually, you know, that in, if, if you take the intensity at each bright spots in this image, 
that we actually should be able somehow, you know, to discriminate single atomic, single atoms in this particular column. So let's see uh, what we, how, how, why, why does that appear now? You, you can have a very basic formula by saying, say, if we improve the resolution and if we look better, get better aberration corrections, we improve sensitivity. And that's something which is very important because it enables single atom detections. So how far actually are we with the exit wave reconstruction and with, with dark field images in terms of single atom detection? That's the, then the question here, you know. And if we are in the area of single atom sensitivity so that we can count the atoms in, in, in a number of columns, you know, that would be great because what we can do then now is, is first of all, we can look at light atoms. We can look at similar, uh, single atoms, small cluster investigations are possible. We can look at segregation, a doping effect, at stoichiometry and all this kind of stuff. Very interesting subject which we couldn't address in the electron microscope because of the lack of sensitivity. So this is, this is the most I will go into theory here, you know, just to give you an idea about what the difference is between the STEM and, and the TEM. And, and actually it is not good just to look at microscopy and, so and in looking at, you know, oh, we do face contrast microscopy, STEM or whatever, you know, and you have all these different communities supporting themselves. There is physical reasons for choosing one or the other experiment. And what we do at the, at, at the moment is try to figure out which experiment is good for what purpose. Now, one of the features that phase contrast microscopy does is this one. If you plot here sample thickness against typical signals that we observe, what you will find as a function of sample thickness is that all signals oscillate with sample thickness. So the electron wave penetrates an atomic column and oscillates along the atomic column. And the chemical information is actually dicked in the, dicked into the length of the oscillation. So if you have light elements, like for example carbon, you have a very long ex extinction oscillation. If you have a very, very uh, heavy element like gold, you have a very short extinction oscillation. That's where the chemical streak comes in. Now, this is not a unique experiment because take, for example, a sample thickness like this one here. Then you might have areas where all the different elements show you the same you know, contrast. That's one of the problems in phase contrast microscopy. Z contrast microscopy is totally different. What you have there is for light elements, you have an almost linear behavior of the curves. And for heavier elements, you have some type of exponential saturation. That makes the experiment unique. But what I will show is actually that this is very good for light elements. This is very good for heavy elements because of sensitivity reasons. Hmm. So how do, we, how do we come about, you know, how do we measure, uh, quantify, you know, how many atoms are in the column? So we, we have the intensity of one blob and we want to find out, you know, exactly how many atoms are in there. And that's how we do that. We have now this exit wave reconstruction, so we describe a, a wave. A wave is characterized by its amplitudes and its phase. And uh, this exit wave reconstruction gives you exactly this information. It gives you the amplitude of the wave and it gives you the phase of the wave. So this is, for example, a hole in gold. This is a gold sample. Here's a hole and here's the same hole. This is the amplitude. This is the phase of the, of the whole stuff. So people traditionally describe this data in this type of uh, argent plots. So what you do is you, you measure the intensity in one of these particular columns and the phase the amplitude and the phase in the same currents and put that into this plot. So what you have here is the imaginary part of the wave and here is the real part of the wave, basically. And then you see, this is a simulation, actually. That is what we expect. And each time, so it's not a continuous curve. So each time, if you kind of add an atom in the column, you go from one of these data points to the next time. So that is what we simulate. And this is what we do in the experiment. So you see, if I kind of have an intensity measured here, uh, it might be on that curve here, and I see there are three atoms in the column. So that is a very uh, interesting plot, and if you kind of just make an, an angular average around this, this uh, distribution, you come up with this phases, and you see each time an atom, column, uh, an atom is added to the column, you know, you see one of the peaks, and we can actually measure how big the phase changes per atom. We can quantify that from an intensity plot. And we find for gold, for example, that is 0.53 radians. And uh, we also see the, what the width of these distributions are. It's 0.1 radians. So we have a signal there and we have a noise there and we can characterize these things. 
So what we then can do is we take such an exit wave, you know, this is again the same hole, and just pinpoint in each of these pole points how high the atom columns are. And this is just, you know, the color code for that. The black ones here is one atom hanging out at the edge, you know, if you go further in there are two atoms, three atoms, five atoms, five atoms, six atoms in the columns. And so we can actually do two things. We can count now the number of atoms in each column. We can give signal-to-noise ratios for their detection. And we can kind of produce a two-dimensional, we can linearize the whole thing. Because you see these oscillations as a function of thickness, that bothered electron microscopists since many, many years. That's for the first time we present a solution to that type of problem. And that's very important because if you want to move then in different directions and look at crystals in different directions, you actually would like to have not the electron wave but the crystal structure. You want to go away from the electron wave and you want to go towards the crystal structure. For this you need this linearization. So the chemistry comes in. If you have gold, for example, it gives you this particular phase change per atom. Indium is lighter, so it gives you lower phase change per atom. And so, so the gold chemistry is displayed there. And we at the moment look at indium gallium nitride to count the number of indium atoms in this material and all that kind of stuff. So method is generally applicable. And the linearization problem is generally solved. So we can go from uh, electron exit wave to crystal structures. And that enables electron tomography. Let's do that same story in a different manner, you know, in a similar approach for STEM. You know, now we know, you know what the sensitivity is of a TEM. Now we need to know what the sensitivity is of a STEM. And the way we did that is we again produced a picture of a STEM, STEM picture of a, of a uh, uh, gold film. And then we looked at the intensity maxima. So I've plotted here all the different intensities at the maximum that comes in the image, you know, and just sorted them. And if you, if you blow up this curve here, and this is a blow up of the curve, you see these steps here. So I differentiated the whole curve, basically, and just to see you know, where the steps are, to better clearer see them. And then you can again see, this is one gold atom in the column, this is two gold atoms in the column, three. Intensity, you know, we deal with quantum mechanics, intensity comes in portions at that kind of stuff. And whenever you can identify this portion, you can count the number of atoms in there. And again, if you kind of then take this image, and uh, we, can, we can address you know, how many atoms are in the column, and we can make a three-dimensional map and linearize the whole problem. So we can also do that for, for, for the Z-contrast image. We can again measure what the noise and the signal level is. And again, it's a step towards tomography with STEM, not with TM right now. So um, there's one thing I wanted to point out. You know, how come we, come we have now all these beautiful results right now? Why is it not, did it not appear 20 years ago or something like that and people have done all that kind of stuff? So we try to figure out you know, a way of how to judge what the performance of a microscope is into in terms of sensitivities. And that's what this one is showing. And the point I want to make is here, oops, is actually that uh, the sensitivity that we have at the OEM is one of its outstanding characteristics. Actually, it's one of the, I think it's the most sensitive uh, instrument in the world, and that makes it so unique. It's, uh, people talk often about resolution and stuff like that, I, but I think the biggest impact comes through sensitivity. So what we did is actually we took again gold, we made an exit wave reconstruction, the phase, and then uh, measure the phase across such lines in these images. And if you do so, you'll see here's a noise level in the vacuum, then the phase goes through a maximum and decays. Now, uh, if you think again about this uh, argon plots, what it means is basically that we have a circle here. What we measure is actually this phase angle. And uh, if you now go along the circle, you see that the phase will increase, goes through a maximum, and then decays again. So what we measure is basically then this angle. And now what a different microscopes, if you take the sample, carry it from one microscope to the next one and see what the differences are. A good microscope is basically the red circle. A bad microscope is a blue circle, so you have much less signal in the whole, whole, whole uh, thing. And so we did that here. So this is a measured phase, this is a calculated phase, and then we kind of go through the old technology, lantern hexaborite, you know, no field emission gun or whatever. This is the maximum phase value that you get, this is the noise that you get. With such a microscope, you hardly can see a single gold atom. It's just at the limit, you know, signal to noise ratios are on a single gold atom. If you do the same thing with an FEG gun at 120 kilovolts, for example, you're already a little bit better. This is done at the NCM here. If you do that at a 200 kilovolt FEG gun, we are substantially better. 
Now, if you kind of go and uh, aberration correct these microscopes, which is an instrument that is in Munich, we are going from this point to this point. If we do the same experiment with the with the uh, 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 OEM, we have the highest sensitivity that I've measured so far, and this is a signal to noise ratio of about six per gold atom, and that's why all these these things kind of pop out now. So what you can keep in mind is improving sen resolution improves sensitivity, improving aberrations improves sensitivity. The OEM has a terrific uh, 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 signal-to-noise ratio, about six per gold atom, and uh, it is probably the microscope with the largest sensitivity in the world. So now I've kind of put all this kind of stuff together when people come up and ask, what type of experiment should we do at the NCM? So I need guidelines for that, you know? So these are some guidelines that I put together, you know? So what we have now here is the signal-to-noise ratio for the detection of a gold atom. That's what we measured. So this is our value here, and this is the z-contrast value that we measured. This is some data taken from literature. We know theory. We know how you know, the signal depends as a function of z. And uh, I took that from Kirkland's calculations, and then you just have this one calibration point, and then you just uh, extrapolate. And what you then see is actually that in the z-contrast measurement, you lose single atom sensitivity if you say, if I have a signal-to-noise ratio of 1, I don't see the atoms anymore. Then we lose at around z equal to 40 single atom sensitivity. But the curve is con uh, concave, so it's an amplification curve, so it is easier to see chemistry with z-contrast. This curve is suppressive. So in phase contrast microscopy, you have more difficulties to, to, to discriminate between different chemical elements. But it is by a factor of 10 to 20 better for than light elements. And you see that people start exploiting that in literature. So I've put in our two examples here. Uh, this is one for, for, for STEM. This is uh, uh, investigations done at Bell Laboratories, uh, David Muller. Um, what he took is a piece of silicon. So this is pure undoped silicon, and then he put antimony in here. So if you look in this plot, silicon has something like 14, so you cannot see single silicon atoms, but I take a whole matrix of them, bring them over one, let's say 40 angstroms of silicon. If I put such a matrix, one antimony atom, which is about 50 here, I can see that, which is why this is now enabled, this type of investigations. Or this is another example recently appearing in science where people kind of in Jülich looked actually, you know, on strontium titanate and this faint blobs in here they are actually oxygen atoms. So we, we knew we can see X oxygen atoms, but what they show here is basically, see this is a line scan, so you have the oxygen signal always being constant. And at some point you see a drop. So not only that can they see you know, oxygen columns, they can see fluctuations in the oxygen. It is because phase contrast microscopy is so sensitive down there. So let me just then go to the last point. So we have now all the sensitivity gains. And so at some point I was talking with Paul and, and they had this beautiful tetrapods and there's recently a publication about that. So they make low magnification images, they make high magnification images about these tetrapods and they come up with a model, which is this one here, how these, these tetrapods are formed. Now, with all our electron microscopy, it would be actually very nice, you know, if we kind of make a tomogram measure all the atoms in this particular substance. Now what people can do these days is this down here, um, that's the state of the art that, that I did that together with, with Nigel Brown, with, with uh, Ken Downings in Ken Downings lab, the biologists, they do a lot of these things there. Um, you know, you can kind of uh, just make a tomography at the moment with about five angstrom of resolution, which corresponds about to this, this picture. Now we know we can do these pictures, but we cannot do yet this tomography because of all these linearization issues and all that kind of stuff. And that's what the team project is about. So we want to basically you know, make microscopes that are much more sensitive to be able to make tomography uh, uh, at atomic scale resolution. And so I kind of uh, would like to invite you, you know, we have a workshop on that whole issue, you know, in two weeks from now, and uh, it's actually five laboratories involved. Um, Uli Dahmen is actually the program leader on this team project, and what it will do is basically, um, it will take advantage of the developments in aberration correction. We see the biggest benefits at lower voltages, so what we want to have is basically a microscope that has ultra high resolution at 100 kilovolts, for example. Um, we, and we do that because we want to better control radiation damage. Radiation damage is a big issue in electron microscopy. And that will enable actually tomography and it will be good for hard materials. 
and we'll go up to 300 kilovolts for soft materials. That's, that's what we're doing. It will enable new in situ experiments, and the sensitivity improvements that we'll get are through aberrational correction, deep sub angstrom resolution, and choice of voltages. So, this is my conclusion. If you go back to Feynman, what I said in the beginning, you know, in the 60s he dreamed about these things. And uh, I think it's within reach today. And I think uh, electron microscopy will this whole thing uh, make it come true. And I do not want to finish my talk without uh, acknowledging all the people at uh, the NCM that help us with this investigation. Jörg, for example, is the one who kind of pushes this linearization in phase contrast microscopy. Xiao Yu does all the investigation about the dislocations. Uh, Chris is sitting up there as our best technician at the microscope. If, if, he, if he cannot make a microscope run, nobody can, you know. And there's, of course, many, many of the staff scientists and also involved. Uh, we collaborate with the university, with, with companies producing microscopes, with people who have ab uh, aberration corrected microscopes, and with theory on, on the group. You know, Dick van Dijk is actually the best, one of the best theoreticians that is around these days. Thank you very much for your attention. Using electricity, basically, in these uh, microscopes, right? Electricity. Electrons. Electrons, right, yes. Moving electrons. Yes, yes. So, um, and then you're using computers to interpret the data yes. into visible pictures. What is the danger of misinterpreting the data? It's uh, with every new, I mean, this is a very, very well valid question, no doubt about that one. What I actually did is I actually put out, you know, some of the images that I produced onto the web. And I kind of waited for people to produce different, you know, programs for uh, calculating exit waves and things like that. And uh, it happens, of course, you know, there's a particular program around, FEI did one of those, you know. And in Australia, they kind of do something like that too. And so they took down these pictures and I didn't tell them anything about that and just, you know, their own algorithms and stuff. And it's almost identical what they find than what we found. So the exit wave reconstruction process that we use is actually a very reliable process. The danger that you have is actually, you know, in um, the fact that you need to tune the exit wave reconstruction process. See, if you, if you just make an exit wave reconstruction, it's for some reasons it's always wrong. You know, sample thickness or whatever, you know, and you have to propagate the wave and do several things about that, get the intensities right and stuff like that. It's not enough that you kind of, you just see a particular number of dots in the image. The spacing of the dots needs to be right, and the intensities on the dots needs to be right. And people overlook that from time to time. And I think there will be quite a lot of publication coming out, you know, where they kind of, you know, claim something which may be true, but you will never know if it is true or not, you know. This is, this is like with every new technology and, and science that comes out, you know, there is a danger of misinterpretation. But I'm, I'm very confident that the process that we have in there uh, is, is, the, is, is good, you know, and produces data within, reproduces data to within 1% or 2%, and it is totally independently proved. Any other questions? Um, do you do any uh, time-resolved uh, imaging? where you maybe have a pulsed electron source that's uh, synchronized yes. to some other no. event? No, is we it don't. Does anybody do it? Is it, is it possible? Or? Not that I know about. It, 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 you can make everything possible, you know. It's just, uh, see, electrons are so intense, the sources. Actually, they are a thousand times more intense, the sources that we have, than, than, than the light sources. Uh, brighter than the light sources. So we don't really suffer from, from this type of stuff. But of course, if you then want to study, you know, very short scale processes, it would be a very, very nice thing to have something like that. People type of blank the beam at best, you know, that they kind of say, okay, I, I, I take the electron beam continuous, you know, put in some blade, you know, take it out and put in, and thereby produce pulses, you know. But, but it's not, not yet on the same, same level, you know, than, than what you would do at the LS, for example. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much.